Hello and welcome to another conversation about conversations. I am your co-host Jacob Kubrak. With us as always is the lady legend and YouTuber Jules Swisher, the man, the myth, the legend of conversations, Ivan Farber, and a special guest today, a legend in his own way, author of the Connectors Way book, as well as CEO of the galvanizing group, Patrick Galvin. And chief galvanizing officer. That's correct. Great to be with you guys today. Sorry, I messed that up, I guess. Patrick, welcome to the show. Jules, lady legend, good to see you. Savage, I learned that Jules is Savage Swish. Savage Swish. (laughs) On Instagram, yep. On Instagram, and Jacob, you are the legend maker. You just buddy. are. Make us all legends. Yeah, that's how it is. That's, that's what this podcast is about, is conversational legends. Legends. Yeah, we all want to be great at conversations. I think that's something the people want. Today's topic is connecting in a virtual world. Or, Patrick, as I, like, I like what you say about it, is the difference between socially distance, which we, we don't want to be distant socially, or physically distant. Yes. Because we are physically distant, but we're not socially distant. We so only are socially distant if we choose to be, which we shouldn't do. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So before we dive into the episode, though, we want to give some show news. Jules, you go first. Tell us about your news. Yes. So I am launching a YouTube channel. This is something I've wanted to do for a very long time and have always had an excuse. So Um, I will be posting my first video this morning after this podcast, and it's going to be really focused on personal and professional development um, with a couple little side things, a little fun, going to use my humor in that, try to make it a really good time. And yeah, so um, Ivan, maybe I can bug you to link that down below in this episode. Yes, you can. I want you to know how courageous it is. Knowing, having done it, it's courageous. And one of the concepts that we talked about last week and that my, my mentor on podcasting gave me is you have to suck at first. Mm-hmm. You suck at first and you just have to embrace it. Mm-hmm. I sucked at first, totally. <laughs> I'm still, still improving here. Um, but I have some big news for the show. Big, big news. You, you guys want to hear it? Yes. All right. So we've, we've been on Spotify. We've been on Google Podcasts. We've been on Apple. Guess what? two new places to play, Amazon Music Ooh. and iHeartRadio. All right. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. And another, another milestone here. We have just passed 4,000 downloads. I, I can't think of like anyone more than my mom, Jacob's mom. That's, grandma. That's downloading. Yeah, grandma. Uh, but we are in 34 countries and 35 states. We've been downloaded. And the top 10 countries, USA, Mexico, Ireland, Canada, Australia, Belgium, the United Kingdom, Singapore, New Zealand, and India. Had no idea. No idea. Thank uh, you 30, for listening. Yeah, for, thank who, you for whoever's listening. Whoever's out there, I don't know what language it is, but thank you for listening. Love it. Top five episodes. Episode number one, be able to hold multiple perspectives. That's one I did in January. Top two, Jacob, our first ever episode together, our conversations a sport. That's, that's the number two. All right. We should do part two of that. Part two. Yeah, we should do part two. Uh, handle, how to handle skepticism, dealing with upset. And then number five, let's talk about empathy. And we're going to talk about empathy on next week's episode. It'll be probably – and – we did the riff off of let's talk about sex, baby. <laughs> let's, let's talk about you. Let's talk about empathy. Yeah. You like that? Sure. Is, um, is that salt also, and pepper? Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Just like my beard. Salt, <laughs> yeah, and, pepper. Yeah, salt and pepper. Yeah. Just yeah. like your beard. I think. Yeah. <laughs> that makes you um, garlic. And then, and then we're making some progress on YouTube now too. We've got 1600 views on YouTube. We've got 99 hours viewed. So we're just about to hit the meaningful century mark there. And Jules, 
you made the difference here because the top two episodes were your first two episodes, peeling the pomegranate two and peeling the pomegranate part three. Great. Awesome. All right. So before we dive in though, we want to hear from our sponsors. Uh, Sponsor number one, 503 Building. You should see the work that 503 Building does. Uh, Gates, raised beds, tables, um, you name it. I'm a little bit biased because my son runs 503 Building. But if you want to see 503 Building in action, you can go to facebook.com forward slash 503 Building. A second sponsor that we have, the book Conversations, How to Manage Your Business Relationships One Conversation at a Time. And a third sponsor of this episode in particular, Patrick, The Connector's Way. So thank you for being a sponsor. You're welcome. And now- and Thank you for being a guest. Let, <laughs> let's get to you. Let's get to you. Enough <laughs> patting yourself on the back, Ivan. All right, enough of that. Great job. <laughs> So I'm gonna give, give Patrick a proper introduction here. Patrick was a natural born connector. He was the kid in school, the kid that I was jealous of, who made friends wherever he went. And his relationship building skills have led him to different jobs like Patrick being an ice cream scooper, to running your family furniture store, and now, as I said earlier, being chief galvanizing officer of the galvanizing group. You're a professional speaker. You've done a TEDx talk. You're an active member of Rotary. And uh, we're just really glad to have you here today. So with that, um, what else would you like to say to introduce yourself and have us know about you today? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. It's great to meet all three of you uh, virtually. Uh, Relationship building, although I call myself a natural born connector, which is true when I was a kid, uh, when I (laughs) came out of business school, I had unlearned all those lessons and I thought that business success was not about relationship building. I thought it was about marketing and advertising. So for me, uh, I've kind of come back to myself, so to speak, and everything that I've been doing over the last 18 years with the Galveston Group, with our own business, with our clients, just has reinforced this concept that it's all about relationship building. You know, all the things that you learn this school are important but unless there's a relationship, you're not going to be successful in business. Tell us about your book. The Connector's Way came out in 2016. Uh, when I first wrote it, uh, it took me about, and if you guys have it and hold it up, it's really not a long book. It takes about 90 minutes to read. Uh, it took me about five years to write. So I started writing a nonfiction handbook about business relationship building. And if that sounds kind of dry and boring to you, it was to me too. And that's never a good sign as, a, as an author. So I started thinking about the books that I like. So I enjoy uh, Bob Berg and Agmandino and Patrick Lencioni, who all write in the parable style. So I thought about all the lessons and all the things I wanted to teach about relationship building and said, you know what, I can teach you through a story. So it is a story about a guy whose business is on the verge of collapse. And through a series of rather fortuitous events, he meets some great relationship builders who show him a different way. And the main character is some semi-autobiographical, but I've also woven in elements of different people I've met over the years, different clients. There's nothing spun out of whole cloth. So the book is really true stories through a, a narrative and through a novelistic form. I've changed names to protect relationships and sometimes only last names. So people have spot themselves in the book. Uh, and it's been out for four years, sold over 30,000 copies. It came out in China last month, uh, which goes to show that relationship building is not something that's unique to our country. It's all of us, all humans. You know, do, we do business with and refer business to those who we know, like, and trust. And The Connector's Way was written to help people build those relationships and connections that are going to take them to a higher place professionally. And then if you apply these things in your real life, you're going to be a much more self um, satisfied person as well as just being better connected to folks. And there are, there's a resource online for, to get the seven lessons from the book. Do you want to tell us where, what their resource link is? Yeah. Yeah. If they go to the connectorsway.com, uh, you can download a PDF that looks really pretty of the seven main rules for business relationship building that the principal character in the connectors way learns. And it's not rocket science. It fits on an eight and a half by 11 sheet. And I've had a lot of people tell me they print it out, put it next to their computer, and just to remind themselves about the essential truths of relationship building. Yeah, I really like the concept. I enjoyed the book. 
I'm embarrassed to say I, I went looking for it. I had bought the hard copy. I went looking for it. I couldn't find it because I did want to hold it up, Patrick. And our books are, I would say, very complimentary. Like, there you go. There you go. Um, <laughs> your focus is a little bit more macro. It's one relationship at a time. And my approach is more micro. It's one conversation in, inside of that relationship. So I think they're really complimentary. And your book, would you say it takes uh, an hour and a half to read? An hour and a half for most people. Yeah. yeah. It's my easy book, reader approved. Yeah. yeah it's my not, book is uh, not. Yeah. My book is not an easy read. My book is a six hour read. Gosh. And it's very dense. It's very, it's no, there's no fluff, Jules. Uh, it's very textbooky. But anyway, that's the micro versus the macro. Um, Jules, Jacob, what, what if any questions do you have for our guest? Where, where did you uh, come up with the idea of, uh, you know, hey, I'm just going to write this into a book uh, between everything you're, else you're doing? Well, it really came from the main character happens to be someone in the insurance world, which I've never worked in myself, but we've had a lot of clients over the years. And I was hearing stories, common stories um, that were kind of repeating themselves. And insurance is a discipline that had um, a real sort of aha moment, like how are we going to survive in this new world when, you know, Geico came in and started spending a lot of money. People thought, well, the independent insurance agent channel is going to go away. And it didn't happen. Uh, insurance is still dominated for personal insurance by folks who are building relationships, selling mul a multiplicity of insurance products from different carriers. And I was hearing kind of, well, what is it that's allowing some to succeed and some saying the world's on fire, we, we can't compete as a, as a small business. And universally, those that were doing well were building relationships. And they were rooted in their communities, they were getting referrals, they were bu building deep connections with people. And those who were flailing, or afraid to come into the field, believed that they couldn't compete. And I, it was just the storyline that I was hearing, and I thought, you know, that could be told as a story. Um, and the thing is, it's not an insurance story. I, I thought I was gonna be doing all this work in insurance, and it's been adopted by some other industries. We can get into, get into that later. But um, it was just hearing stories and realizing, you know what, as opposed to telling people, you know, here are the best practices, why not embed them in a narrative? Because people remember stories more than they remember facts and figures. And we have our own point of view when it comes to relationship building, but we're not there to convince people that what we think about in terms of relationship building is the absolute right thing. A lot of these folks are really good at what they do. So we create a conversation, to your point, Ivan, so conversations are important, where people are sharing their best practices, what their frustrations are, and really there's so much collaboration that takes part in a cohort. Uh, so we work that way. And also now we have all these mini courses that we've created that are short format, 15 minute courses, very interactive with video and exercises and things that people can do. So people through our cohorts do those mini courses. And then sometimes organizations will get the mini courses and sort of do a self-guided uh, study of relationship building. Yeah, I love, I love the format and I, I'm probably going to copy you down the road here because uh, it's just a great format. And speaking of conversation cohorts, we have here four of the greatest minds about conversation cohorting. And I want to switch now to our roundtable discussion. I don't know. It's really not round. It's really more rectangle table. Oh, yeah. Um, and I want to start with a question. And, and Patrick, we'll, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, we want you to tell us all of your trademark secrets. All of them. No. We want you to give us some of your uh, best strategies with regard to building connections with others. And we're gonna focus a little bit on being virtual in that. So that's the, the lemon, if you will, on the, on the cup of connection. Right. Well, I think it's probably best to have an alpha point that's a very strong one. So our alpha point when it comes to relationship building is that of service. Um, when you're out there figuring out how you can best serve others, whether they're your customers, your prospects, your referral partners, your family members, um, things will flow well. And not thinking from the get-go, what am I gonna get out of this relationship? It's not an extraction methodology, but it's really a giving one. When that is your starting point, you know the tactical things that you do, we can talk about them, but I think you have to have a core. And the core for me, and for what we advise people to do, is really think service first and everything flows from that. Jules, how about you? 
Yeah. So when I'm trying to build a connection and I'm going to, I'm going to give myself a harder challenge of somebody who's difficult to connect with, maybe someone that you don't have a lot in common with, um, you know, those types of people, we all know them. <laughs> um, I think about what can I do, like, what can I do to make them feel heard and understood? And if I can do that successfully, then I can connect with them. The problem is, I think when we're trying to build connections, we're constantly trying to find what we have in common, what we both like, all those things. And the truth is, there may not be much there, and that's fine. Doesn't mean that you can't connect with this person and, and connect on a more human level. So I'm always thinking and asking questions about what, um, asking questions skillfully and trying to really make sure that they know that I am here to hear them and understand what they're going through, what their problems are. Um, and that's kind of always the place that I like to start from. And I know that if I can establish evoking those feelings, then I've got a solid ground to build a lasting connection. Jules, I had trouble connecting with doctors early on. I just, I did not have a strategy for it. So tough. I did not know what questions to ask. And yes, so tough. It's so a, tough. Yeah. So probably so the I, hardest group of people. I don't know. That, that's a bold statement, but it's incredibly tough. Yeah. And something you said, and it, it dovetails nicely with Patrick with your comment is you come from service. You're like, I'm here for the long haul. I'm here to serve. And that's, that's your alpha. I love that, uh, Patrick. That's your alpha. Speaking of, speaking of alpha, our alpha dog here, Jacob, what, what's your, give us your secrets on how you connect with others. Yeah. So before we jump into that, and I'm going to try to tie this in with what Patrick said, but I'm on the opposite side of that. Those, those little Jedi mind tricks, you know, but that basically is sales in, in some aspect, right? That's the science, uh, excuse me, that's the art of it, right? Is connecting with people. I also don't think connecting with people kind of stops ever, right? It's kind of like a constant thing, right? You want to keep connecting, like, whatever piece of information you can get from them through a good conversation and good questions. You just want to rely on that, you know, to ultimately close the sale or, or, you know, get to the deal, however you want to call that. But I think that the people that just do it better or connect in a better way, those ultimately are those little Jedi mind tricks and, and they're not necessarily always sales tricks. They're more just, you know, getting to where you want to help that person and where you think the help is. I'm all about the Jedi mind tricks. I, I think if you use your Jedi powers for good, um, there's, there's a fine line between manipulation and leadership. And uh, one, of the, one of the essays in my second book is, is called Manipulation Has a Bad Reputation. Because if you go back to the original definition of manipulation, it's to skillfully influence. Now, obviously, there are some people, there are bad manipulators in our world. The word has gotten a bad reputation, a bad connotation. But the way I think about meaningfully connecting with people is by being a conversation leader. And so most of my conversations are physically distanced. Actually, of the last 18,000 conversations I've had, only 250 have been in person. So predominantly, my work as a relationship manager is on the phone. You have a and spreadsheet, don't you? I do. I have yeah, a spreadsheet. 18,000 lines. Yeah, because, <laughs> well, I've got messages on there too. So it's about 24,000 lines. It's incredible. And, and the way, thank you. And the way I've approached it is as a science. So when I came up with the 10 lessons in my book, I have the 10 lessons on my monitor, on the left-hand side of my monitor. And I use those 10 lessons both as a, preparatory exercise before a conversation, build rapport, use questions skillfully, listen, focus on needs, exercise self-control. I use those that. I use it while I'm on the, in having the conversation. That's the benefit of being on the phone. And then I use it afterwards as an evaluation tool. Um, it's, it's maybe more scientific, more intentional, but it's worked. It's just really worked for me in terms of uh, building business, getting additions, 
getting referrals and ultimately retaining clients, which is more my role as a relationship manager. Patrick, what are some of the things you're doing now though and telling other people to do now given, given COVID, given the pandemic? Well, you, I think, planted a really important seed with folks uh, about the distance between socially distancing and physically distancing. So there are some people who say that their businesses are really challenged right now because they can't meet face to face. Um, but here we are, the four of us using Zoom, and there's so many products out there, Teams and Facebook and Google Hangouts and Microsoft Meetings. I mean, there's so many different platforms. And right now, I think is the best time in history to be having conversations with people, looking them in the eyes. And, you know, I miss hanging out in the coffee shop uh, and talking with people, but I can actually be a lot more effective in terms of connecting with somebody today in Portland than an hour from now with someone in New York or Singapore, where I'm talking to a lot of people over in Asia because of the book coming out in China. Um, and you can connect with people. And you can connect, uh, I think, so much better now than ever before using video. Um, you know, I track the difference between a phone call versus a video in terms of efficacy of depth of connection, and there's no comparison. So if you're um, saying that, you know, in COVID, my business is really struggling because I can't meet with people, then you just haven't adopted you know, what is so good um, about having the pandemic in 2020 as opposed to even 10 years ago. Um, and everyone's a little bit bored, a little bit stir crazy. They're seeing the same people, their family members, not that people don't love their family members, but people will welcome the opportunity to connect. So I think right now it's leaning into what technology has allowed us to do. Yeah, if we had to do it on Skype, it's a diff different story 10 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, great points. And I, I've seen some of your videos too on, on YouTube uh, with regard to uh, you're, you're a user of virtual backgrounds. And I saw the video where you had a, your, your favorite coffee shop, a picture of it in the background. And so that was just a, a very creative way. And that's one of the things that struck me and knowing you and hearing some of the ideas that you have, you're very creative in how you, you approach your connections. Speaks yeah. well to the connector's way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you got to have fun with it. And here we go. I'll join you guys for my favorite. Uh. <laughs> yeah, this, so pick out your favorite coffee shop. Uh, actually hold a cup of coffee and say, hey, let's meet up for coffee. People will laugh when they see it. It's like, you got a lot of wood in your coffee shop. What's going on there? So you, know, it's, you can have a lot of fun with it. Exactly. Fun is important. Jules, what about you? You, you would ideally meet with the, the doctors that you're calling on, but obviously face-to-face -face meetings, especially with doctors, can be like really negatively looked upon. What, do you, what are you doing now? Yeah, so I, if I can't get a face-to-face -face meeting, and oftentimes I can read the conversation, read the room well enough to know that this is just not even worth asking on, and, um, or not a good, not ethically, not ethical to ask in this, in this specific mm -hmm. clinic. Uh, so what I like to do is kind of the same way. I like to try my best to do a zoom meeting. Unfortunately, in my, in my world, um, being a medical device sales rep, uh, they're not really interested in zoom meetings either. They're not really interested in meeting anyone because they don't see what I am doing as urgent. They think that this can wait. And we have very differing views on that. I completely disagree with that. And um, so it's really important, I think, for me, um, in terms of building that connection, a lot of it has come down to consistency for me. So one of the things that's like gold, and I, I consider it like such a gold star for me if I can get a doctor or providers or whatever, if I can get their personal cell phone number, that is like, that's good stuff. Now, <laughs> I, uh, if, if they do, if they will give that to me, then that's great. And you still have to be careful about how much you reach out and everything. But that is like, if I can just get on like a first name basis with you where I can shoot you a text or whatever, if I just need to talk directly to you, not have to call the front desk and have them transfer me back to your MA and all this stuff. Um, that is super helpful. So I love to develop that consistency, try to make it as personal as I possibly can. 
Um, and if I do have the chance to just speak like a live conversation, whatever that is, phone, Zoom, whatever, uh, if I do get that opportunity, my goal, especially now, is to make a personal connection first, kind of that building rapport, but more so getting to a place where we're on a first name basis, you're open to talking to me again, and we can kind of build from there. Jacob, what do you do differently because of COVID or if anything? So technology, obviously one of the greatest uh, goods, sometimes limitations, right? Because it depends on what technology is available. Um, but in regards to finance, I mean, the phone is never going to go away. And uh, usually that's kind of like your, your first string and usually going to be your best string because you know, depending on who you're speaking with, a lot of people don't have access to technology, right, to, to make a lot of these things possible. So I think as much as you can do to improve your phone skills at, at this point is, is what I've been doing. I mean, just because, like I said, it's great to get on a Zoom call when you can. And, you know, for the people that have the technology and, and are fluent and, and can use it, but sometimes people just, just can't. And, and you're in the line of business where, um, you know, the, the phone is the only way. Uh, the other thing I want to point out too is, uh, in Patrick, in regards to marketing, um, you talked about, you know, presentation and service and all that stuff. And I, I always, one thing that always comes to mind is like, we're going to go back to the car dealership is, uh, people, you know, will, will always buy, you know, Lexuses and, and BMWs. And, and that's mostly because they do really good marketing right? And, and they have good service. They hire good people to sell and service those cars. So I think those are great points um, as well. And, and I always think of the car companies. I'm sorry. Why are you sorry? That's just me being a, a, a little kid and, and, you know, loving cars, obviously, but yeah. Apple's so I'm going to answer, one. I'm going to uh, piggyback off of your answer. Like, I think the phone is a wonderful tool. Uh, I think Zoom's great. I think that some of the meetings that I've been doing when I travel across the country to meet with clients, I think those are going to be replaced by Zoom. But the phone is very intimate. And it's, there's, a, there's a paradox. When you look at someone or when you're physically uh, present with somebody, there's some things you can't say. And as a relationship manager in financial services, I actually think it's really intimate to have people be able to tell me things without looking, looking at me in the face, allows me to ask really in-depth questions about money that, that people might not be comfortable with if they were face-to-face. -face. I've had to learn the skill, though, of really probing deep without being in person, and the art of delivering that question in a way that it's not gonna put them on the spot, but it's gonna give them the opportunity to say, am I, a, am, I a risk of, am I at risk of losing you as a client? So tone, intonality, things that you can control verbally, that you, auditorily that you can't visually. So I love, I love the phone. Now, my company wants me to move to video calls, but a lot of the, again, a lot of the advantages that I see to phone and just verbal go away when you do that. It's a different skill. It's, it's a different world and, and it's so unique, right? Because of what we've got going on, but it, it's going to be exciting to see how it changes back. You know, if, if people do go back to normal and start seeing face to face a lot more, or if it's going to continue to stay this way. Um, but yeah, the, the phone's not going anywhere. Uh, that's for sure. So as long as that technology is around, we'll be all right. Early, early in my career, I did meet face to face. And one of the things I found is that if you're going to do a coffee appointment with somebody, you've got to get there, you've got to be on time. Sometimes you wait for them. Sometimes you have a good conversation. Then you have to go to your next appointment or back to your office. And all of a sudden you've lost two and a half, three hours, not lost, I shouldn't say, but you've invested half your day or a third of your day in one meeting. And so when things switched to phone for me, 
and I could consistently do the reps and have six, eight, 10 really connected conversations in a day, that's when I feel like I really got much better was, the, was doing the repetitions. So that's, that's a game changer too. I, I think the key is uh, to be where your customer, your prospect is. So if you have customers and prospects that are better phone folks because you know that based on time, then by all means use the phone. If you're developing rapport and they're open to a video call, do that. Another thing that instead of sending a text message, send a video text. I do those all the time. I'm sending way more videos through text than actual words because it's a connection point. So I'm very um, agnostic when it comes to communications technology. And what I try to do, going back to my point is, you know, start with service in mind. What would serve the best interests of your client or your prospect? And then use that communications vehicle. It's not like I'm a phone guy. I'm a video guy. No, it's like, who are they? And I'm going to use that channel to, to establish a, a deeper bond with them. Yeah, I like, I like that you're very, flex, you're very flexible in, in your approach. Agnostic is a, is a great word for that. Too. One of the, one of the, um, and we did, first of all, Patrick, you and I met right online through LinkedIn. Yep. Uh, we had mutual connections, but that's how we met. And then we went and met in the physical world too. Yeah. Had a good year. Back, back in the good old days. Right. Back in the days where you could. And one of the things, one of the strategies you shared with me that, that I thought was really amazing. And, and I'm going to admit, I haven't done it, but on LinkedIn, you can endorse people. Right. And what you said is don't do a lot of endorsements necessarily. Uh, rec but, recommend, recommend, not endorse. Recommend. You can endorse, but I, that doesn't have so much value. It's really writing, writing a recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. Writing a recommendation, um, sometimes unsolicited, right? Like you just pick a person, write a recommendation. T tell, tell us more about that. Yeah. I mean, you have to be connected to somebody to write them a recommendation, but anyone I work with, um, anyone who I really know and feel confident recommending, it's not this phony thing. It takes me about five to 10 minutes to write a quality recommendation for somebody. The numbers are amazing. How many people actually have organic recommendations versus ones that, that they asked for. And it's like 95% of all people have all their recommendations because they've asked for them. So when you're the person who comes in there recommending somebody without them asking for it, it blows people away. And the perceived value of that is so high. And every single time they go back to their LinkedIn profile and they're looking at it and they see those recommendations and you're the only one who's ever taken the time to do that, where do you think you stand in terms of their uh, depth of social connection? I mean, it's, it's, it's what you can do to become a category of one. If you become that person who's lifting people up through your recommendations and that's part of your brand, then that's a really important thing. And I'm amazed that people just don't do it. And when people start doing it, uh, they see results. And I always say, look, if you try this and it doesn't work for you, just give me a call. You can scream at me for half an hour saying you wasted part of my life because I was writing. Work. I've never gotten that call. I've gotten a lot of calls saying, hey, Patrick, that was a great tip. And that made, that's made a huge difference in terms of my connectedness to people. Yeah, really, I really love that. Great skill. Yeah, and the, the key is you got to block time for it. So, and don't get overly ambitious. Just say, hey, look, I'm going to do one this month. That takes you 10 minutes. Put it on your calendar. Put it on your calendar. Write LinkedIn recommendation. You don't have to think about who it's going to be. Just have it on your calendar. And when that day rolls around and you've got a meeting and you can't do it, then just shift it to some time that week that you can. Block the time out and you will do it. And if you do a handful of these, this will become a continual practice for you. I keep thinking that I want people to recommend the show and give us five-star rankings on the show and you know, write the stuff. But what I like about what your, your philosophy is, is I shouldn't be thinking that way. I should be thinking, who can I recommend? Who can I praise? And your philosophy, Patrick, come from service and come from selflessness it's really, it's really a great philosophy. So I, I take that from you in preparation for this show, but also, also now really, really great stuff. So I re really appreciate what you stand for. I really, you know, it. it's just an easier way to live. I mean, you feel happier about yourself lifting people up and you don't have to worry about weighing the quid pro quo because here's the thing you do that consistently and things will come back to you. Not always from the people you expect, uh, but if it's just a, a, the way you, the way you move in the world, um, so much of that comes back. So whatever you invest in other people comes back in <laughs> multiple levels of abundance. It's just, it's just a fun way to live. And uh, uh, 
uh, things take care of themselves. Yeah, I really appreciate your influence in that. Um, with that, I want to move to the final portion of the show today. The, the part I call resolve is resolve this, tie it up in a bow and go, go around, give everybody an opportunity to make a closing statement. So Patrick, you're our guest. I'd like, like you to go first. Well, relationships are the, the, the cornerstone of business. It's not something that we tend to learn in school. I went to a good MBA school. My, my partner did too. Neither one of us had a relationship building course. So if you believe that relationships are important, that's a mindset. But if you want to build your business through relationships, that's a skill set. And it's something that anyone can develop. It doesn't matter if you're an introvert or an extrovert. It doesn't matter if you're glib or you're not really great with words. If you just work at it and get some coaching, read some books and say, this is going to be a focus, uh, you can really have your business life transformed and in so doing have your personal life transformed as well. Because when you focus on relationship building in the business world, the carryover effect to your personal life is a really good one. Patrick, give us your website uh, address again. Uh, theconnectorsway.com. You can download the seven rules for relationship building, get links to The Connector's Way on Amazon. It's a Kindle book. It's an Audible book. All the formats there. Excellent. Jules, what's your closing statement today? Patrick, I love what you said about that. I think that oftentimes, especially just thinking about me as a young professional coming in, Sometimes I get really intimidated by a lot of these concepts and a lot of these ideas. You know, you have like old senior vets who have been in the been in the industry for a really long time. And I would just encourage anyone out there who's listening right now to not be shy about this and to know that you have every capability of growing in this area just as much as any one of us here do. And um, I know it can be intimidating trying to like venture out into this realm, but the truth is you're already doing it. So <laughs> you're already there. If you just make a commitment to yourself that you are going to learn and grow in this area. Um, again, like Patrick said, your business life can be totally transformed and I've seen it in my, my business life and I'm young, I'm 25 and I have learned more in the last year than, oh my gosh, my whole life. So um, and I've seen the results of that. I've seen the success of that. So, um, yeah, give it a shot. Give this a go. Thanks. <laughs> Jacob. I, uh, I, I can definitely appreciate the, uh, is it, what, what did you call it? The referral fund recommendation? On LinkedIn. recommendation. Sorry. R I had it relationship referral recommendation. It's all, uh, it's all in the same breath, but, um, yeah, I mean, just going above and beyond for people, right? To 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 say thank you and 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 be kind and and live your life, you know, the right way. And and I love that phrase, move through life a certain way. So all of that stuff is good, and it all re relates to uh, to sales as well, um, because you have to build relationships usually with people you just you know who are picking up the phone, and and all those things are important. So. Just keep doing that. Stay positive. And, and, and like Patrick said, it, it always usually comes around. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Jules. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, my, my closing statement is it's really one of gratitude for the three of you having this conversation about conversations. In my opinion, there is nothing more important in our lives. Our relationships, our careers, everything that we want to create in this world, it happens through conversation. So really great that you're having this conversation with me. It's really great that all the people out there in podcast land, uh, we wanna hear from you. We wanna have you be a part of this conversation. So reach out to us. You can reach out to me directly, Ivan at conversations.biz, that's B-I-Z, because mostly we're focused on business conversations. Although of course, Anything you do to improve yourself in conversations uh, will improve your whole life. So with that, again, once again, I want to say thank you and really appreciate you being a part of this conversation about conversations. Thank you.